It's called multiple personality syndrome disorder, Alfred. Pause here. No, it's not multiple personality syndrome disorder, Alfred. Batman should stick to being the Dark Knight. Let the psychiatrist do the psychiatry. Hey GQ, I'm Dr. Eric Bender. I'm a psychiatrist and psychotherapist, and today I'll be looking at some characters from Arkham Asylum. This is The Mental Breakdown. Two-Face? You're a lucky man. He's not. Who? Your driver. Harvey Dent has become Two-Face at this point. He has a need to flip a coin to make decisions. This could be considered a compulsion. A compulsion is a behavior you feel you have to do. There's something in you that makes you feel like you absolutely have to do it, and if you don't, it feels really uncomfortable. Often a compulsion is performed to get rid of an obsession. The obsession is the thought you have. It makes you uncomfortable, makes you anxious, so the compulsion is to do something to get rid of the obsession. A classic example is someone who feels that they're dirty. That's the obsession. The compulsion is to wash their hands to feel clean, to get rid of that anxiety. What might have happened here is all the trauma that he endured with Rachel dying and the ambiguity of it all, like what happened, what didn't, he now wants clear-cut things. He's very anxious when things are not clear-cut. So he's flipping a coin, is it heads or is it tails? Is he gonna die, is he gonna stay alive? So it's very much, I want order, I wanna make sure it's decided, it's gonna be A or B. So the compulsion to get rid of the anxiety over things being vague is to flip the coin. Two-Face might also be showing cognitive dissonance. That part of him that's Harvey Dent is very human, doesn't want to kill people. But if it's reduced to a coin flip, it could be that he's not killing someone, he's just obeying the coin, he's just doing what the coin says. And that might be something that is a way for him to move forward with this criminal life. So he's not doing something bad, he's doing what is destined to be done because of this coin flip. Riddler? You inspired me. You're out of your goddamn mind. What? This is all in your head. You're sick. Twisted. How can you say that? You think you'll be remembered? You're a pathetic psychopath. Begging for attention. The obsession that Riddler has with riddles becomes somewhat pathologic, meaning it's actually causing impairment in his daily functioning in some ways. Again, always looking at how the patient presents, there is a story about the Riddler in which he didn't want to leave a clue for Batman in the form of a riddle. He didn't want to say, hey, here's this riddle, see if you can solve it, and that would lead often to his being captured. He actually says to Batman, I didn't want to leave a clue, I didn't want to do it, but I had to. So that is really an example of an obsession, the obsession with the riddles, the compulsion to have to say a riddle, to either feel smart the way he wants to prove that he's smart, or to challenge himself, saying he can function on the same level as Batman. So there is this obsessive, compulsive component to his behavior. Joker. I'm an agent of chaos. <laughs> oh, and you know the thing about chaos? It's fear. If I were to see the Joker, I would first of all wonder, does he belong in Arkham Asylum? He's an individual that has come across to me as not having any mental illness. Yes, something is off with him, as people say, in that he commits the crimes that he does, he kills people, he wants to introduce anarchy. He tells Two-Face, introduce a little anarchy here. I just do, that's what he says. He's just ready to create chaos. He's an agent of chaos. All of that makes me think, are there any real mental health issues such as depression or anxiety or any psychosis, anything like that, and I don't see that. I do wonder about antisocial personality disorder. That doesn't mean antisocial, like, hey, I don't want to go associate with anybody. I want to just hang out in my room and play video games. Antisocial personality disorder means that you're actually having no regard for laws or rules. There's continual lying, there's breaking of rules, and violence might even be part of how you get things done. In this case, he certainly meets criteria for antisocial personality disorder, and I do think he's a psychopath. Not all people with antisocial personality disorder are psychopaths, but in this case, I do think he is one. Given that he's a psychopath and there's no significant mental illness, 
related to why he's committing the crimes he is, he doesn't belong here in Arkham. The evidence that he, first off, doesn't have a mental illness we just went through, so now we look, if we're evaluating him for sanity, meaning at the time of the crime, did he know what he was doing, did he know what he was doing was wrong? Now I look at additional evidence. Here, Commissioner Gordon says there's no labels on his clothes, everything is designer. These type of things suggest the Joker wants to be evading capture, wants zero identity. He knows what he's doing is wrong. Now an attorney might argue, well, maybe he just likes to have his clothes made wherever. Well, sure, maybe he has a line of clothing he likes, but this can also be seen as potential evidence for evading capture. He's also tried not to get caught. He has done things to clearly avoid capture, which means he knows what he's doing is wrong. He even explained step by step to Harvey Dent, I am creating chaos. He knows what he's doing. So not only is he not of a mental illness, he also knows what he's doing, knows what he's doing is wrong. He belongs in Blackgate Penitentiary. Harley Quinn? This is me, Harleen Quinzel. When I was a kid, my dad traded me for a six pack of beer. But however many times he tried to ditch me, I kept coming back. So right away, I see a kid who has been essentially neglected by her dad, traded for a six pack of beer. She keeps trying to come back and come back and come back and win his affection. This is actually true in real life that somebody would do this. Often I might see kids who are just dying to get the affection of their parents. They really want to feel loved by their mother or their father or whatever caregivers they have. There's a drive to do that. When people don't get that affection, it can really have implications for the rest of their lives. My father used to beat me up pretty badly. Anything except that. Every time I got out of line, BAM! Or sometimes I'd be just sitting there doing nothing. POW! Pops tended to favor the grape, you see. Uh-huh. This is Harley Quinn, otherwise known as Harleen Quinzel, who apparently was practicing as a psychiatrist at Arkham Asylum, even though she didn't have an MD, but had a PhD. Clearly, Gotham is corrupt. As human beings, without even realizing it, we tend to recreate relationships in our lives, even those that don't serve us well. They might be dysfunctional, but they're comfortable. It's something we slip back into. Here, she recreates this relationship with her father, with the Joker. He doesn't want her. He's neglecting her. He's abusing her, similar to how her father did, but she still takes it. And that's actually part of her psyche that I would want to understand more in talking with her. Desire becomes surrender. Surrender becomes power. You want this? I do. There is a condition called folia adieu, which means shared madness. Essentially, someone is spending time with another individual who has mental health issues, often psychosis, which means having a break from reality, maybe having some hallucinations or hearing things, and ends up sharing that same type of issue, so having their own psychosis. What I've noticed is Harley doesn't seem to have psychosis, nor does Joker, but there is a question of, is there some type of shared, at least approach to the world, some type of shared mentality that she's picked up after spending so much time with him? If I were to have to give a diagnosis to Harley, I would look actually in the personality disorder category. So personality disorders refer to somebody having a vastly different way of interacting with the world than their cultural norm would expect. In this case, Harley does have an unstable sense of herself. She doesn't feel like she's a whole person necessarily. We see that in different ways. And that could be a trait of borderline personality disorder or just a borderline trait, meaning she doesn't have a full personality disorder. But what fits Harley most is histrionic personality disorder or histrionic traits. Someone with histrionic personality disorder is very uncomfortable unless they're the center of attention. They might use sexual behavior to get attention, or they have a physical appearance they make up, and you can see that she does that, so that she will get, get that attention. Someone with histrionic personality disorder might also have a shallow expression of emotions. They might have a very unique way of speaking that's somewhat dramatic, and they might have a real dramatic flair to how they present. All these things categorize her so far. One of the main things, though, is someone with histrionic personality disorder is very suggestible. The things that Harley does su subject herself to for Mr. J's love, they're actually really horrific when you think about it. So when people talk about wanting to have this kind of mad love relationship, I don't know how well that would serve them in the real world. There's a syndrome called Florence Nightingale syndrome, 
where the caretaker falls in love with the patient. It's been suggested by a psychologist in England that that's actually what's going on in this particular case. Harley does find this way of attaching, and I think this is it. It's this shared feeling of not being loved. The Joker is manipulating her here, though, and she doesn't see that. She's blinded by that desire to actually feel loved. Mad Hatter. I'll cut that cowl off your neck before you'll take her. I've waited my whole lonely life for her. Then all you've waited for is a puppet. He seems to be convinced that he's a character in Alice in Wonderland. That makes me think of two things in particular. On my differential diagnosis list, I wonder, is there a form of OCD? where he's so obsessed with Alice in Wonderland that he ends up compulsively living in that world, dressing up that way, even kidnapping a girl who is Alice. There is OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, where one has that obsession and the compulsions of behavior that you do to get rid of the anxiety from the obsession, but you can have what's called poor insight where you don't recognize that these are intrusive thoughts, that these are thoughts that actually don't match with a realistic situation, that you don't need to double check, triple check, quadruple check your locks in the door, that you don't need to make sure the oven is off 20 times. So it could be that he has OCD with poor insight, but it seems to be more delusional, something that he really embraces from a young age where he just continues to live in this world. It brings up an interesting question of where is fanaticism, whether it's being a fan of a sports team, being a fan of a game, being a fan of a cartoon, a comic, where does fandom end and something that's more delusional begin? I look at whether something really impacts someone's functioning. In this case, he's functioning in this world where he's kidnapping young girls. So this is clearly a disorder when it reaches the level of impacting somebody's daily functioning. Mad Hatter might also have some pedophilic tendencies. He's essentially zombified her. Mad Hatter likes to put mind control devices into hats. There's actually a story in which Mad Hatter put mind control devices into tape players and gave them out to young Dick Grayson's female classmates at school. The idea was that he was then gonna sell these girls into slavery to a corrupt millionaire. Here I see an obsession with hats. He's going from one hat to the next, looking at all of these hats and they make him so proud. It's not just a collection, it's something more. There's almost something he gets out of this that's like a, a narcissistic thing. And the reason I know that is he says, the next place is here for Batman's cowl. That's my next one. So he has this way that reminds me of a serial killer where they take trophies, which to them are proof of their skills. Look at what they've done. I'm reminded of that with Jervis Tetch, the Mad Hatter. He looks at each of these hats and thinks about what he's done and how he's won over these individuals. Whether he's killed them or not, in the 1966 version of Batman, we just don't know. They didn't really allude to that so much. So he has this psychopathic, almost vengeful side to get back at people. He's got all those jurors right there in the closet, ready to, in some ways, collect something from them too. In real life, there are serial killers who do the same thing. Ed Gein used to take the skin from his victims and make lampshades or clothing even out of them to have a trophy around. Mr. Zaz. Fly away from this world. I'm saving a special spot for you. Right here. In taking a history of Mr. Zaz, you learn that he was on a bridge ready to die by suicide when someone came and mugged him. Someone came up to him with a knife. Mr. Zaz ends up actually killing that person. And he feels that he's doing a favor to humanity by freeing people of this horrible existence. And from that moment on, he decides he's gonna go ahead and kill people. And every mark on his body is for one killing. So he'll carve it into himself. Mr. Zaz actually is a psychopath. He doesn't care. He doesn't love, he doesn't have any kind of attachment to people other than using them for what he wants. We see that here in the scene where he realizes that the teenage kid has swallowed this diamond. He's gonna cut her open. 
he doesn't care this is a kid, he doesn't care it's a person, he just wants what he wants and he's gonna do what he wants to get it. There's nothing that is psychotic about him, there's no break from reality, he doesn't seem depressed. He might be depressed at times, but depression doesn't link to his violence. He doesn't have any anxieties here. He is a psychopath. The ventriloquist and Scarface. We got us a squealer. No boss, that can't be. None of us want to screw up a sweet deal like this. Glad to hear it, Muggsy. Cause if there isn't, I find him, it's drapes for that rat. No, Mr. Scarface, remember your blood pressure. Shut up! I want your opinion, dummy. I'll pull your string. Here we see the ventriloquist and his dummy, Mr. Scarface. In this version of the story that I see, the ventriloquist says Mr. Scarface is his own person. He believes he's someone totally different. At the same time, the ventriloquist is clearly using his voice to voice Mr. Scarface. This could be considered a dissociative identity disorder. Dissociative identity disorder used to be called multiple personality disorder. I don't think that's the case here because this individual is going back and forth from one personality to the next. That's not how this presents when somebody has dissociative identity disorder. Somebody with DID, it's called, would actually have one personality present for usually some amount of time, and then the next one would present for some amount of time. There's not gonna be this going back and forth like this. That would be extremely rare. It's called multiple personality syndrome disorder, Alfred. Pause here. No, it's not multiple personality syndrome disorder, Alfred. Batman should stick to being the Dark Knight and let the psychiatrist do the psychiatry. When Batman's standing in front of Wesker and they hear the voice of Scarface from the other room, again, that's information that suggests they're two separate people, unless Wesker's such a gifted ventriloquist he's not even moving his lips in any way to throw his voice. And Batman does wonder that. You see Batman in the Batcave talking to Alfred about the different wave patterns that play out when he's recorded Wesker and Scarface. He's showing different physical manifestations of each character. And that actually can happen in real life. If someone has dissociative identity disorder, one of the alters might even have a different physical presence than the others. One might have a limp or one might have a medical issue. One might even have an accent. That kind of physical difference can in fact happen. Here it's with a voice. Maxi Zeus. Be not afraid, my muse, for once thou hast been cleansed by the fire from Olympus, thou shalt be as a goddess at my side throughout eternity. <laughs> Maxi Zeus believes he's a Greek god. He's talking about Mount Olympus, the ancient Greek gods, where Zeus, Hera, other people are living. This weapon he's created is gonna fire the fires from Mount Olympus. So there's something not quite right in what he's thinking. A psychotic disorder means that somebody has a break from reality and they might have a delusion or a belief that is fixed and firm even though it's false. That's one part of psychosis. Another could be hallucinations, hearing things, seeing things other people don't see. Another part of a psychotic disorder could be disorganized thoughts. Things don't flow, things are just going from one place to the next in one's head. Maxi Zeus doesn't show all of those. He does show delusional thinking, but he doesn't show hallucinations, disorganized thinking, and delusions that would often go with schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is a break from reality, but someone has hallucinations. They often have the disorganized thought that I mentioned earlier. He doesn't have that, so what he actually has, if I had to give a diagnosis, is delusional disorder. That means that he has a fixed false belief, and no matter what, as I'm spending time with him, letting him know, have you considered that perhaps we don't live in ancient Greece? Have you considered this? He's not buying any of it. He's continuing in this way of being that shows he's this powerful God. So to me, that means this guy is delusional. Now, this is truly Olympus. Surely it can be no other place. This beautiful Demeter, goddess of the harvest, Double-faced Janus, Lord of beginnings and endings. Maxi Zeus is walking through the hallways of Arkham and he's commenting that each individual is a Greek god or goddess. He's really stuck in this delusional world. This isn't what's called waxing and waning where it's going away and then it comes back and going away and comes back. This is constantly there. That's more of a sign that this is a delusional disorder. 
Mr. Freeze? I want to live like this, abandoned and alone. A prisoner in a world you can see but never touch. Old and infirm as you are, I'd trade a thousand of my frozen years for your worst day. In psychotherapy, you're often taught to think about how you feel when you're sitting with a patient because that can give you some clues as to what the patient might be feeling. I feel extremely sad when I sit with Mr. Freeze. He's somebody who, yeah, he wants to take over the world and freeze it all. But what I feel sad about is that he is incredibly lonely. When you see here the millionaire come up to him and say, I want to live like you, he says, what are you, insane? He's using it colloquially there, not by legal definition insane, because he knows how lonely this existence is. He says, there's, there's, this is a horrible loneliness. I wouldn't want this for anybody. It is incredibly painful to think about not being in touch or not literally physically touching another human being for the rest of your life. And he's really stuck with that sadness. In addition, the sadness he experiences with the loss of his wife, all of his experiments were about how to help his wife, Nora, with a terminal illness survive. How could she live? So he's alone. He's still pining for his wife. There is that incredible sadness he still has. There might be some element of complicated grief here where even after all this time, he knows his wife is not there, but. He still focuses on her death and focuses on those people that caused him to have this condition so that he couldn't help his wife. He's in an incredible amount of pain. Some people ask if Mr. Freeze might have schizoid personality disorder. Schizoid personality disorder means that someone doesn't have any desire for relationships and they actually don't want any human contact. That's not Mr. Freeze in my opinion. He actually would love contact. He says, I give up a thousand of my days for one of your worst days. It's really sad. I don't think he necessarily has a mental health diagnosis. Sometimes I see people who don't have a diagnosis, they just need some support. Penguin. My baby. Did you miss me? Uh, uh. The penguin grew up in really difficult circumstances. He was born with this deformity. And his parents decided they were so ashamed of the deformity, they were just gonna drop him in the sewer. He ends up being raised with animals at a zoo. And he is this incredibly deformed adult now who's very, very angry and murderous. Trauma that happens when you're younger really does have an impact on your life. It doesn't make you wanna become a murderous individual necessarily. That's pretty rare. But here we see Penguin really focusing on all that pain, wanting other people to feel the pain of losing their children or wanting to make sure that kids aren't with their parents and, and he's dispersing this pain that somewhere is in the roots of his own existence. It's incredibly traumatic to feel like you're not wanted, that you're not loved. Even as an adult, we see how those scars play out and how they impact someone. The penguin, in some ways, wants to be loved, but he's not giving that message by being this dark and focusing on crime. So that's gonna be hard for him to convey. In therapy, that's the kind of thing I would work on with him is to say, okay, are you doing anything that's giving the message that you really wanna be connected with people? I would attempt to point out to him that stealing children is not giving that message. Arkham's pretty corrupt. There are a lot of people here that don't belong in a forensic hospital. If you got a lot of forensic psychiatrists in here to evaluate the individuals, I have a feeling a lot of them would be determined to go to Blackgate Penitentiary instead of Arkham Asylum. I always wanna remind people that Mental illness does not lead to violence. You're 15 times more likely to be struck by lightning than killed by a stranger with chronic psychotic illness. Good treatment can be helpful. I'm not saying that good treatment would cure Joker or Penguin or Mr. Zaz, but good treatment is important. It's important to find and it's important to offer. And I need to talk to some people around here about getting new psychiatrists at Arkham.